So I think as to avoid, and we just we just had a conversation a little bit before we turned the microphone on about how I what, what I should say before I say welcome to Q. Mm. I think I'm just gonna say welcome to Q. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, people will be so confused that no one will introduce me anymore. Like, yeah, good to see you. <laughs> They'll be like, yeah, thank you. It was like when I used to meet my my um, my friend's parents, and I never knew whether I should call them sir yeah. or you know Mr. <laughs> oh, so and so. You know, just hi. We got to that point of confusion. Hello, hello right away. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, we can do. We can at least talk about the new album. So we do at least meet Chris. I had never met Chris before before I, I listened to this new record. So let's, yeah. let's take a little bit of a listen to it. Sure. Girlfriend, don't feel like a girlfriend. But lover, damn it, be your lover. So that's uh, Chris. That's girlfriend. If you were to introduce Chris to someone at a party, yeah, what would you say? If you were to describe Chris to someone at a party, what would you say? Uh, well, I, I would say Chris is a daring, soft, um, slightly sometimes weird, but very tender woman who just uh, wants to meet you properly. She's eager, she's eager to meet you. She's, she's eager to meet you. Yeah, because, I mean, um, Chris has, has, I don't know, again, I just clarify it because I know it's a bit weird, but I, I work with um, with personas, but it doesn't mean that I'm kind of creating a character um, that is very much different from me. I'm actually expressing myself through um, through those personas, and I think I have this relationship with to theatre that is kind of really honest, actually, um, meaning that I'm using theatre to be actually really um, exposed. Mm. And um, I'm not comparing myself, but for example, like uh, David Bowie, which uh, who could use like a different incarnation per album. So, so this was this was the closest thing I could, I, I, the closest comparison I could make in my head. With yeah. it. And I even said it to Saroja before we came really? in. I said, so is this like Ziggy Stardust? Kind of, yeah. But Ziggy Stardust was even more a construction and at some point it got killed by David Bowie who kind of moved forward and, and the Thin White Duke happened. And, yeah. But it, but I think I do understand the relationship between... Um, I don't think, for example, the Ziggy Stardust and the Thin White Duke were constructions that were not um, genuine. I think it was just a way to express uh, something really deep and kind of uh, um, actually really uh, authentic mm -hmm. through a theatricality. You know, and I kind of, I kind of like to work like that also. Mm. So I think Chris was just the latest iteration of myself in a way, and um, and Christine and the Queens uh, was like the best way to tell my story in 2014 when the album was out. Mm -hmm. And when I worked on the second record, people were calling me Chris more and more actually because it became my nickname. It was a shortened version of Christine. Yeah. And I changed, and I was older, and I had like different stories to tell, and I was like, actually, Chris feels more like. You know, it feels more genuine to be called Chris on that record. And also, of course, there was like the joyous idea of slightly perverting um, the story to tell something even with that. I, I find it funny that you use the word genuine because I think that's a quality that other people put on your art rather than... Because I, I, I just assume whatever comes out of you is genuine because it's, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's literally the art that you make when you sit down to make art. You know, of course, it's going to be genuine. And yeah. I would normally not bring up the aesthetics of this because mm. I'm very in love with the album. Mm. But I, I did find a very interesting story that like you didn't quite feel like Chris and then a photographer told you to cut your hair... <laughs> well, it was a bit more intricate than that because I, I before I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounds a bit gloom like that. It's always complicated to assert nuances, but that was an interesting one because when I arrived at the photo shoot, um, they asked me before the photo shoot to write a self portrait, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Ula, do you know that you're asking me to write a self portrait?" Which is basically what I like to do. So I sent them eight pages of actually kind of a manifesto for the new album and of it, the idea of me explore, exploring a different way to be feminine and to be sensual. And I was talking a lot about the thing, you know, the, about Chris as I was becoming. And I arrived at the shoot and I was kind of rocking this half bob, which was kind of weird. And um, The half bob haircut. Yeah. yeah. And the photographer was like, well, actually, you know, you should, you should, I think your hair shorter would even even give more justice to the ambivalence of the character you're talking about. And I was like, yeah, I always wanted to do that, but I'm never, sh I don't, I'm not sure it would suit me. And he was like, you should, you should just stop being afraid. This is, this is what you're talking about in your, in your, in your writing. And I was like, it's actually true. And I, and I decided to cut my hair. So I was just like, 
it was interesting that he would say that to me also. I didn't wait for the guy to tell me to cut my hair to become who I wanted to be. But I think it was interesting that he read the whole self-portrait and that he was actually seeing something in me that I was not, mm. I was a bit afraid to become and then I became that I, I a little further. I had a question about the self-portrait. There was a line in it um, where Chris tells us, quote, steal the time-worn parades of your manhood and turn them into something way more suspicious. What, yeah. is, what does that mean? <laughs> I was I was interested I mean talking about theatricality I was interested in exploring some of the classic masculine theatrics because I think they are you know it's it's I was interested in disrupting them slightly by just using them as a woman because what does that mean if I'm if I'm actually um embracing the parades of masculinity as sometimes guys could choose to embrace the parades of femininity and just to expose the theatricality of it and I think I was just interested in playing around with that with those codes and and to build actually my femininity with kind of those parades also, if it makes sense. I mean, in part of those parades, I mean, and, and I love this. She likes to fantasize about identity theft. Who did who did she steal pieces of her identity from? Oh, again, I'm I'm sometimes writing and it's like metaphors. I'm not literally stealing from people, mm -hmm. but I think I'm in. I think identity is a construction, right? Yeah. I think every choices we make. Every day is, is a slight of is a slight construction. Mm -hmm. So um, as an artist, I do like to explore that, and I and I think when we do explore that a bit further, and sometimes when we deconstruct, sometimes people are either upset or disrupted, and I think it's it's a part of the game also. But it's something I like to play around with. We've talked so much about I think appearance so far in Chris, um, but I know just from watching videos, you you've changed the way you've danced uh, a lot. I mm -hmm. feel like from from, so. from one record to another. Mm. Well, how did, did, did am I onto something? Do you think? Yeah, no, it's interesting because I, I I wish I you would develop that because it's interesting. Do you think I'm dancing differently? How? I think you're maybe a little bit more guarded in your dancing. Guarded. Yeah. You mean it's more? Uh, mm, well, then again, it depends on the video because, for example, the girlfriend video, Dame du Mois is really about the classic pop routine and it's kind of like it's really like precise steps as tilted could be at some point uh, but for example a video like doesn't matter is mm -hmm. so much about actually uh, nothing was being written before the the day of the show and it's actually i'm reaching a point of uh, pure abandon that could that was even even further in the way of letting go than in the first album so I th maybe what I mean by guarded is your actions are very close to you. Like, it, and the reason I asked about the borrowing a little bit earlier was, um, is because I, I saw some Michael Jackson y sort of moves here. You know, I saw the pop shoulder, I saw the hands as trash. That's that's what I was seeing this time around. On the second album. Yeah. Yeah, interesting also because uh, when I um, I remember when I did Saint Claude, the first video ever I did on the red backdrop, mm -hmm. people were talking a lot about Michael Jackson y. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I mean, Michael Jackson is an inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. But on the second album, I also was interested to Eve to, to keep that also because it's a part of mm -hmm. what inspires me. But also to kind of work sometimes more contemporary dancing and kind of some some videos are not even danced, like the five dollars video or the doesn't matter one in a way. It's not really dancing anymore. It's more like expression of. But I do believe that physicality can be sometimes almost more or um, as interesting in in like a routine, you know. I think how you exist, how you walk, also can be just a way to express yourself as an artist. So, 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 so like, lead me there because in in all kind of my artistic endeavors, I've never done it as anyone else. I've only ever just done it as my name or or a group I've been in, the name of the group, and um, mm -hmm. only talk about this as much as you want to. But you know, even when I, I want, even, I even want to go back to the beginning of Christine and the Queens. Like, yeah. what 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 is it that inspired you back then to want to to adopt? another persona, adopt something else. <laughs> it's interesting because it's been, I'm always a bit surprised at how it's a statement, but then again, it's just like, I don't know, theatricality is so much a part of pop music. And, 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 and of like, entertainment. And like a, and a stage moniker is so much a part of it also. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think like I'm the only one doing it. So it's always interesting because I think it's because I'm also exploring identity as a construction that it becomes even, it become even more like a statement. Mm. But at first, I just decided to choose another name to be on stage because I did love to have a stage moniker. I was just empowered through it. Um, 
uh, as some pop stars just slightly changed sometimes their name to make it catchier. It was also a way. And also it came, it came with the idea of choosing, which was really powerful for me at that point. I was like, um, you know, by, by f writing my first song and by choosing my stage outfit and by saying, oh, I'm going to be named Christine, was the pleasure and the power of choosing for the first time. And it came with empowerment. Um, you know, as a, as a young woman, I was like, yeah, I'm going to choose my narrative. I do want to appear like that on stage. I do want to work my sexuality like that. Um, uh, well, so it was, it was really, yeah, it was also an act of, there was a softness and a power in choosing, yeah. Is it the kind of thing where by adopting a persona and by adopting a theatricality, you are more comfortable on stage to access parts of you that maybe aren't as easy to access just as yourself? Yeah. But this is why sometimes it's um, even puzzling to me to try to explain how it's not um, a construction because for me, for example, stage, the stage expression and theater, mm. it's been in my life since I was a kid and it's it's been my language since I was a kid. So it's actually a way to relate that is t for me quite natural and I don't, it might sound a bit weird, but. But I thought you were shy growing up. I thought you were. Yeah, but this is why we have a theater. You know, the stage is something else. It's a different space. It's a space of, uh, you get to choose a lot more things. You get to choose your language, your visual language. There is um, a symbolism on the, on, the, on the stage. I mean, on stage you can, you can appeal to um, someone's um, imagination in ways you cannot do sometimes in real life. Mm -hmm. In the stage you can point at the void and say there is a castle. Yeah, sure. So I don't know, there was always a way for me to be more comfortable on the stage. And, and yeah, sometimes in life I was a bit more uh, shy and... Uh, and also, like, the social filters uh, in real life were sometimes a bit scaring me. And on stage, there was, you know, they were only the rules I was choosing. Mm -hmm. So it was more empowering. I used to get panic attacks backstage and not have them as soon as I got on stage. Yeah. Well, I can understand that. You know what I mean? Yeah, there definitely. Was, there was just something about I would be so scared and so nervous, and I would just walk on, and it would all just go away. And as, soon, weird, as, I, as right? soon as I would go back um, behind the curtain again. <gasps> and also, like, things that happen on stage, sometimes accidents or, like, mistakes or, like, um, troubles. It's never a big deal on stage. I don't know. There is some way that I can overcome it. I don't know if it's the same for you. But and on and in life, sometimes the tiniest mm. mistake can make me like panic. I don't know. On stage, it's a, it's a place of uh, fearlessness also that I really like. I don't know why. It's hard for me to like um, I guess express the demarcation between you and and Christine and the Queens and you and Chris. And I think that's just what art is. It's hard. It's hard and it's nebulous to explain the demarcation, but assuming there is a you outside of your performance-ness, right? Just assuming there's a you that's around your parents, a you that's ordering coffee at Starbucks, shy, quiet, or whatever you were, when you say you were able to work things out on stage, do you think that by being Christine and the Queens and by being Chris, it changed who you were when you weren't those people? Yeah, I think it bled back into my life. Because I think b because I think by being exposed with a form that I chose, like being by being known as Christine and now Chris, people kind of met the p the fearless person that sometimes I could be. Yeah. So it bled back into my life after that because in, in a way <laughs> I was introduced properly. So it was a, it was a huge uh, change in my life, and also I think the mutation from Christine to Chris and the newfound confidence and erotism came from that because I was I was introduced as I. I was kind of finally seen as I wanted to be seen, you know. And I remember my teenage years as a dichotomy between what I wanted to express and how I wanted to be seen and how people didn't, couldn't see who I was, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and then with Christine, I was like, finally, people get to, un to meet me properly. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it changed my life, yes, definitely. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I think, I think the second record is made with that stamina, of being like, oh, finally, you know, people kind of get it. So let me, let me, you know, talk to you m a bit more about everything. There was, there is, a, there was a joy in working the second record because of that. Because I was like, oh. and I was lucky enough also for the first album to be that kind of unexpected uh, in France, at least, an unexpected mainstreamy mm -hmm. success all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. I was like, it was even more beautiful. I was like, so you see me, but you kind of like me. 
deal. That's cute. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I, I love hearing that. If you're just uh, tuning in, I, I, I just saw you play a little more music from the new album. I just saw you on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert performing this. Mm-hmm. Take a listen. Christine and the Queens, that's Chris, mm-hmm. that's Louise, that's everything. All uh, of me. With uh, with Come See off our latest album, Chris. Tell, tell me about that song. Uh, have, your, have your tea, by the way. Have your tea, for God's sake. <laughs> and she takes a sip. <laughs> um, yeah, Come See is a, kind of a slight erotic reverie <laughs> about the power of, of a pop song, actually, because I'm... Um, actually, the, the the idea of the song, um, the idea came from a conversation I had with someone at some point I was kind of courting, but without kind of any success. And that person <laughs> yeah. told me... Ah, I know that one well. <laughs> you wanna, <laughs> see what I mean? And the person said, but you know, I just, I just love your music so much. I'm listening to you constantly. So I was like, oh, well, if I make a song about making out with you then, <laughs> it would be as if we were in love with each other. And And I always fantasized already about the idea that it's fantastic when you write a song because it comes from like a solid place which is you mm. and a really um, intimate uh, precise one and then it dissolves into people's lives and it not, it's not even your song anymore it's it becomes yeah. and it's wonderful and I love that so it was the, the encounter of those two problematics so I was like let's make a song about that about the pure idea of making love to someone through music which sounds a bit no it sounds a bit actually one, wonderful it sounds lovely to me yeah I, w- I would also argue that it's often not still your music even when as soon as you put it out yeah. because especially in France mm. but also in North America as well there's such analysis of of your music in terms mm. of gender identity in terms in terms of sexuality um and I think there's there's so much um you know there's questions around you know why did you write such a thing and how could you mm. write such a thing and not 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 in a bad way but like mm. But I, I don't get the feeling that you sit down and say, "I'm going to say this about a particular topic," because I, I just know how art works. You, you, you're inspired to write music, right? Yeah. At some point, um, especially in France, at some point, especially around the second album, actually, I was like, "Guys, just listen to the album, also," <laughs> you know, because the conversations were like exceeding the very nature of also the the record. Does that bother you? It doesn't bother me because I don't want to shy away also from 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 those issues. But at some point I was like, this is maybe getting a bit too far. And also we are not talking about the music, which is the core of what I'm doing. And I was, you know, I, I spent hours educating journalists about queerness. And I was like, but I do also want to speak about the record. You know, I made it with like sound references I love. We never talk about it. Like it felt like the the main thing that I was working on was totally absent from conversation. So I was not bothered, but I was a bit like puzzled. Puzzled, yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's maybe because I don't know. I think I'm, I'm really vocal about things also. So it kind of probably. Um, and I think also like uh, the album has like references that are really um, sometimes American and uh, and English sound wise. So I think like especially in France, sometimes the I was talking about Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Cameo and uh, and the G Funk, and they were like, "Yeah, but let's talk about the short hair, though." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> or let's talk about pansexuality. Yeah. That's... I mean, I mean that, that, the 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 only reason I bring that up is because you you said in a recent interview and you identify as pansexual and and gender queer, but yeah. but again, I felt like that dominated the conversation in France for so long. But yeah. that's such a that's such a personal thing. I know this is where it it's always a bit. It's it's not that personal. I find it's a sexual orientation, like you know, Jay Z and Beyonce are heterosexual, and actually are giving more information about their personal life that I'm giving. But the problem is I, that like it that became <laughs> no, me neither. But right, I, I'm right, not giving yeah. nothing personal. I'm not giving mm-hmm. names. I'm not exposing who I'm mm-hmm, dating. Mm-hmm. It's just a part of who I am. The problem is it became it became headlines that were constantly obliterating the music. But that's not something I'm responsible of. That's something that shows how 
abnormal still it is to talk about pink sexuality in a relaxing way. And I've been actually saying that since the first record. But what I think is really interesting is that the second one, with shorter hair, it became like the only subject. So I was like, do I need to... Fin, when my hair was long, you were not really paying attention to it, but now it's the only subject you're talking about. Isn't that interesting? I think it was a bit interesting, yeah. But a bit like, are we really still there? I mean, it's 2018. Like, if I cut my hair, is it such a big deal? And does it mean that, you know? And then it became the only subject, sexuality. So I was like, damn. <laughs> we should maybe move the conversation a bit forward. And yeah, it was, it was kind of surprising. I'm going to move the conversation a little bit forward. I want to Let's talk to you it. a little bit about music, and yeah. particularly about this moment. Can you play that clip song? What is your name, young lady? <laughs> Christine. Christine. <laughs> a big round of applause for Christine. Woo! You know, seriously, I'm a very big fan of yours. Do you know that? Well, now that you're saying it to me on the stage, I feel like I can die in peace. Get it? How do you feel and about it? I'm not dead yet. You're not dead yet. <laughs> can you tell us what that was? Uh, I think that was Madonna, right? That was Madonna. I'm not wrong. Um, she's really interestingly shady, though, because shortly after that, she said Christina, <laughs> which, was <laughs> a way, which was a way to say, like, yeah, you know, I'm a big fan, but I'm choosing how I'm naming you. Oh, man. Hold on. You got pulled up on stage? Mm? You got pulled up on stage, right? Yeah. That was the first time I actually encountered Madonna uh, ever on a stage facing thousands of people. So that was not like the best way to process the information. But also that was fantastically unreal. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was quite uh, <laughs> quite something. And I was also really uh, marveling at how we were talking about like um, power and theatrics. Um, Madonna has just this dominant energy that you have to surrender to. Mm. And I was really interesting to witness as a feminist. I was like, wow, she's actually not letting anyone take this, you know, take the ownership of everything ever. And that's that was kind of fascinating because uh, because the energy was like undeniably uh, too strong. We had to we had to surrender. Every one of, of, of us in stage, we had to surrender. Do you think of yourself as a pop music artist? Uh, yes. So the reason I asked that is because I had Troy Sivan in in recently. Ah, um, I like Troy Sivan. And, and Troy Sivan has he has that I mean he has one of the biggest number one records in the world right now. Noise is about uh, sex. It's about it's about his first time having sex as a, as a gay man. Bloom, yeah. yeah. And I said I think of pop music as a conservative form mm -hmm. historically, like in the sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties, there was a lot of um, I just assumed like songs about heteronormative love. I'm so yeah. you know like you know sweetheart, let's go to the dance. <laughs> and he said, No, 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 man. I don't. I don't see it that way at all. Mm. You know, I see pop music as an apparatus to talk about some things that I don't think we as a society are talking about very often. Um, and he said, I just that's just the avenue, but I think it's the perfect avenue for me. And I wasn't mm. planning on asking you about this, but I, uh, how, how about you? What's your relationship to talk? Everything we've talked about so far is some pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. I kind of agree with him, though, because when I think about the pop music as a space, I'd say it's a playful, flamboyant one. I mean, I do think of Madonna, for example, or Prince. So this is where I, yeah, that, that's what made me think about it, because yeah. I think Madonna might have opened up that door. Or oh, Prince. definitely. Yeah. There was a space for, um, again, through theatrics, there was a space for exploration, assertion. And also, and it, and it sometimes became political when you think of Madonna, when you see the, the Truth or Dare documentary, you see that some shows are, you know, threatened to be cancelled because she's like masturbating on stage on the, like a virgin. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes creates like um, political issues in countries she's touring. So you can see that it's kind of fascinating because the pop space is entertainment, of course, but it can become really political sometimes because of the things you're trying to... Um, you know, because of some wars you're trying to push further. And I think some artists kind of used the the pop language to um, to assert the joy of reinvention and of uh, hedonism and of, uh, yeah, but of the, freedom. The trade-off, though, being is that, I said, Detroit, like, there are people who are just going to dance to this yeah. who won't hear the lyrics and won't hear the message. True. How do you square that? Square, what does it mean? Like, how, um, do, you, uh, how do you come to terms with that? Oh, I love the idea, though. Because I think for me, I like to, to think of the idea of the Trojan horse. If you want to just pay attention to the music and then vibe on it, it's great. Yeah. I do like actually the idea that 
you know, the song can be layered and you can just have access to to the first one and it's fine and if sometimes at some point you dig deeper or you f you see the lyrics you're like oh <laughs> oh that's actually about that could be about that oh that's interesting I, I i like the idea because because i'm um i love the idea of like um pure sometimes uh smoothed out entertainment but i like that something a bit disruptive can be hidden into it um more or less hidden actually you can also be blatantly uh, a bit more disruptive, but I kind of I I'm I'm really at peace with that. And actually, I come from theater. Before I made music, I wanted to be a stage director. And what I hated about theater was that it was for the for the elites, for like it was yeah. an elitist art. And, yeah, and it cost a lot of money to go to. Yeah, yeah. So people like not everyone could go to the theater. I was like, what I love about the pop song is that, you know, mm -hmm. anyone can have access to it in different ways, and I'm I'm totally fine with that. And when I write a track, I'm not like as you, we said, I'm not like, what can I say that could probably change the world? I'm like, the first thing I do when I write a pop song is to find the right groove, like mm. to work on the be mm. the beats and the bass line, and I'm obsessed with that, with that gut feeling. But you, you, you've you used the word disruptive three or four times so far. Do you see mm. your art as disruptive? <laughs> I wouldn't say it is especially uh, disruptive, but sometimes I notice it was for some people. But then again, it's the well, reception what of what I'm doing is not something I can I can plan. What I can plan is how I want to express myself and and what I want to tell as a story. But you can really never tell if it's going to be really disruptive or not. You kind of notice it afterwards. It's like the reception. You don't really master the reception. You have to master what you say first and then. Um, how disruptive it can be, I don't know. Sometimes I notice that sometimes, uh, you know, um, for example, that sometimes I was trying to escape a classic version of a male gaze by just being a you know a different way to be sexualized could be disruptive to some people mm. but not especially to me when i when i w i'm a huge fan of other artists like the knife or planning to rock and for me they are even more political and kind of uh um the scale is fin. the for example the latest album of the knife was a hugely political one so uh, for me i'm more like in the pop entertainment but for some people, I think sometimes I might be disruptive. But it's not something I brag about. It's just something I noticed sometimes. Do you think that there'll be another persona? Or will these be your only two? I don't know. It's not something, again, that it's not some a trick I'm playing. No, no, not to so say that it is. So it's a good question because maybe I could stick forever with Chris and grow old <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. Or if I feel, again, that it's too narrow of a form, then I'll change. I, I want to have the freedom of changing. I want, and also like, you know, when I did that and I just stroke out the rest of the name and I took a risk of maybe losing some people, of maybe like um, puzzling some others, but it was just like the artistic choice I wanted to make. There is a relationship to uh, making sure I do the things I want to do artistically that I will forever try to preserve, but with the risks, the risks that it, you know, it entails, but I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know yet. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Thank you for coming in. Merci. Christine, Chris, Eloise has been my <laughs> guest. 